Um, since it is 4 p.m., I am going to start handing over to the director and curators of the Rupert Museum, and I'm sure they'll introduce themselves to you all, but thank you again for joining us. And Robin, I am going to hand over to you, if that's fine. Thank you, thank you. It's wonderful to be here this afternoon, to have the opportunity to be in in your homes, in the spaces you are right now. It's, it's really exciting to be able to do this. So I thank Strauss and company also for inviting us. This, this is a wonderful initiative that you guys have. And so today I'd just like to um, take the opportunity to take you on a bit of a journey, framing the, first of all, the philosophy of the re-envisioning of the Rupert Museum in Stellenbosch in light of the renovation of the physical um, building and its, its surrounding grounds, but then also linking it back to the Rupert family's roots in Graf Renet and how that continues to play forward into our future plans. So for that part, we'll hear from Rolof van Beek, and then I will take you through a quick overview of, of the museum and its background, the, the foundations and collections, and exhibitions since the reopening last year. Elizabeth Scoonby, our curator, will be taking you through some of our more collaborative exhibitions and projects, as well as a, a look at our public programming. And then uh, we'll end off with a, a deeper look at our founders. And for that, we have art, write, uh, art writer Amanda Boerta, who will share her particular insights into the world of the late doctor and, and Mrs. Huberta Rupert both as collectors and, and as people, and really looking at the projects they embarked on, um, certain key works in the collection and the relationships that they, they fostered and, and the values that really underpinned um, all the projects they were involved in, which I think is just a great way to, to anchor where we are now currently and, and our projects going forward. So with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Rolof, to take us through the first part. Thank you. No. I think Rulof is just still muted. Yama Rulof. He's still muted. There, there we go. go. So I didn't see you. you muted me there. Sorry. <laughs> Got it. I'll repeat everything. Uh, thank you, Mia and Robin, for those two great introductions. My uh, part of the presentation today is going to really cover two aspects. One is the museum itself, the renovation of the building and the idea behind it. And the second uh, part would be um, talking about the social impact art prize, what it is, uh, why it exists, uh, what it can do and how we foresee it growing into the future and participate and contribute to the Rupert Museum vision. So a few years ago, together with um, Miss Hanneli Rupert, who has been spearheading this renovation, this re-envisioning um, and this development, we conceptualize the idea um, of re-looking re in the museum as a museum without walls. And the museum without walls really is pretty much what it says. It is taking down the walls to physically make a place like a museum more accessible. It is making it economically accessible. Um, this museum is free. And thirdly, to make it intellectually more accessible. And that really has to do with the programming. The, the physical building itself, together with TV3 Architects in Stellenbosch, um, we spend quite some time thinking about how to take the existing building um, and turning without losing its DNA and without losing its character of a really beautiful Boulan style architecture, but how can we turn something that was an archive, a, a place where, where, where um, relatively traditional art was exhibited, how can we turn that into a contemporary um, art space that belonged to the local community? You know, how do we do that physically? So the idea with the Museum Without Walls in this instance was really physically breaking the building open, opening it up into the gardens, uh, reorganizing it, replanning the physical layouts, creating 
spaces wherein you can not only come and look at art, but where you can come and participate in art, where you can come and draw and make a painting and just lie about on the floor and make a mess or, or touch a sculpture. You know, one of those scary things that you never want to do in a museum because the alarm goes off and the museum assistant will come running towards you most of the time. But this museum is different. This museum is a place where six-year-olds and 86-year-olds can all feel comfortable and welcome. And I think that that's what we're trying to achieve. And that is, is, the, is the vision. So physically, simply creating an entrance that serves as a lantern, you know, as a transparent place that says, come here, enter here. And that's what you see on the slide at the moment, is we added a modern sort of addition to the existing museum in a complementary way. Um, on the bottom right of that slide, you can see the old entrance, which had you know, a whole lot of difficulties. Um, most of it, you don't know where it is. So we made it very clear at this time. Next slide. We're still walking around the building here, looking at the entrance and you know, starting to see the existing collection. You can see the villa sculpture here. Um, Robin and Liz Marie will speak a little bit later about the collection, existing, uh, existing collection and so on. So not only did we change the building or adapt the building uh, or made it more useful towards uh, the Museum Without Wars, but we transformed the gardens completely. Um, what previously was mostly Kukuyu lawn, uh, drinking all the water that uh, in the drought period was even available, we pulled all of that out and planted an indigenous garden that's pretty much uh, self-sufficient um, and not reliant on any uh, sort of water coming from, from the municipal supply for that matter. That's the first thing. The second is we took down an electrical fence. I think a museum with an electric fence and a closed gate where you have to knock on the door to get in is on the opposite scale of a museum without walls. And we were able to really, those very simple mechanisms to implement them and already create a much more open, welcoming physical building. Now the garden is already starting to form part of the programming um, on so many levels, uh, especially with kids and you know, making art in the gardens and drawing from uh, you know, plant life and insect life has already been part of the programming and the exercises um, of the museum. I'm gonna take you just through some inside shots. You'll see a whole lot more later. But we really looked at existing galleries. We simply brought them up to international standards, uh, both from ways to display, ways to light, um, and also just rethinking how all these spaces work and how we could um, uh, make them multifunctional um, and also being able to uh, exhibit both permanent collection and uh, contemporary or temporary collections um, throughout the year. Next screen. Yeah, there we go. Um, we just one back. We added um, the museum before was, as I said, relatively traditional in its art collection, but we now provided space for more contemporary media, the likes of a screening room within the main space, um, creating a, a great sound um, installation. A, 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 speaker installation for performance from music all the way to poetry all the way um, to uh, art performances one more we took what previously was a storage space and turned it into a library space and the focus really here is for students to come in there's free Wi-Fi across the museum to sit down, and have a coffee, and um, are able to look at books and research uh, material that isn't available on the internet. Um, we also provide space outside the library for a poetry garden, um, which previously was inaccessible. So really bringing the outside in and opening the museum out into the gardens has been a wonderful architectural intervention. Um, delivering on our, our big idea. Next screen, please. Uh, 
one of the biggest interventions in this process was what we call the maker studio. And we would previously have through all the years, school groups coming in and the kids lying about on the floor, drawing the artwork, um, you know, doing kind of, um, call it copying exercises, um, specifically with artworks that's part of their curriculum. And not only did we realize the museum had that need, but we also realized that school going kids of our community had that need, which the schools couldn't necessarily provide. So by creating the maker studio, creating a separate space, multifunctional, very flexible space where you could really go wild and make a mess, we answered both of those kind of needs. And next screen, what it allows us to do during, for example, our museum Saturdays, where we have two, three, four hundred people coming into the museum, but to run creative workshops in the museum as well as in the maker studio on the next screen. Next one. Uh, running things like the winter school program, just opening up the building, rethinking the organization, opening up the existing spaces, creating new spaces, all of this to facilitate the idea of the museum, not as a museum anymore, but as a place where you can go and experience art for the first time, making art for the first time, or simply a place where you want to be on a Saturday if you're a six-year-old or an 86-year-old. Um, so the building itself, we're pretty happy on how it's functioning and how it's working, and hopefully for the next 10 to 20 years, this will do the job. Um, and we will see as our programming goes forward um, how much we need to kind of rethink some of our old ideas. Um, but the point is that it's an organic process and hopefully we have as many open-ended resolutions or solutions as can accommodate the kinds of art making that's starting to happen. And um, on a, next slide, please. And we saw really the width and the broad breadth of South African creative thinking when we launched a social impact art prize um, as a massive program and a project presented by the Rupert Art Foundation as part of this envisioning of a museum without walls. The idea was very simple to give an opportunity across the arts categories, not only the traditional museum arts, but also inviting music, musicians in, inviting designers in, inviting architects, poets um, into the conversation and say, what is the art world today? Who is making art today? Who are emerging? Where is the talent? Um, how do we identify this kind of talent? And who will be the next generation of, I don't know, Penny Siopas and Billy Besters? Where are they now? And how can we facilitate that kind of identification? Um, it is what it is. It's a social impact arts prize and it is making social impact. So the question always comes up, what is social impact? And there's so many ways that you can measure it, but very quickly, it's about broadening an individual's expectation of who they can be. And it's a psychological and an emotional impact. Um, it is showing young people what potential they have. It is also turning that potential into something that is economically viable and turning that again into something that is life sustaining. The site for this project is Hrofrenet. It is the sister, there are sister museums there to the Rupert Museum, firstly. Secondly, the Rupert family, it's the origin of the family and they're still very active and um, uh, in this town. But thirdly, Hrofrenet as a town and also the, val uh, the Valley of Desolation is the world's biggest museum without walls. It's the world's biggest repository of dinosaur skeletons, and that already should make you excited. But it's also a town that reflects in its microcosm, South Africa itself, and so many other towns and cities. And we thought that if we focus our aim, if we aim and focus on this town, through arts making processes. We could actually not only make a social impact, but we could measure it. And over a sustained period of time, we can see how we can make a change, how it can shift um, a community. Also, Hrofrenet in itself is a town with so many textures. I mean, even the sheep, the sheep are artworks. 
um, so many textures, so much diversity, yet it's a town with an incredible sense of goodwill and a sense of optimism, even within the drought where it hasn't rained in Crawford for six years. And um, as we were finalizing the art prize, it started to rain and it was, it was ecstatic is all I can say. Um, so I wanna quickly skip because my time is running out and a few more slides just on the town, the kind of beauty that's there, kids drawing clouds, choirs singing so many of them and it leads into my next slide which is tears become rain so we had 120 entries from across south africa and some international entries as well um, we had an international panel of judges who um, judged this work from from wherever they were, were in in an anonymous fashion and we had um, six finalists in the end that that came out as these complex projects that had the potential to, to um, create social impact. Um, we exhibited these projects in the Rupert Art Museum. So the project came home and it's here where people now can come and really firsthand engage with these um, final projects and the winning projects before we actually start building them in Crawford The three projects that were awarded, the first is a choir project and it's really about telling a story from Crawford by 500 choir singers from Hrofrenet, um, creating a sense that they have a voice and that we are very willing to listen to them. And we'll build on that. Um, I want to add this particular project, um, of course, a week before we awarded uh, the finalists, uh, uh, the final projects, uh, the COVID pandemic hit the world and we were stunted for a little bit as everybody else, but as artists do, we uh, improvise and we really relooked the whole project and threw it on its back and we're turning it into very much a digital telephone and a cell phone video and photograph project. And uh, we'll keep you updated as we progress with this project. But I think that's also something that's very important is that this kind of artwork is never finished it's always responsive to the time and to the place wherein it's conceptualized. The second project is called Hello Volk, and it's providing not only a cloud or a tree that can make a condensed water and create a small garden um, in, a, in, in a part of Umazizaki, a part of the Profrenet, one of the townships that has been relatively neglected, but it also provides internet access specifically with content for young adults around health, education, and entertainment. And there'll be a, 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 a part of it which is really teaching young adults uh, to learn to code. And the last project, next one, please, is a indigenous medicinal garden, but as an art project. All of these projects are projects that belong to the community of Crawford which are managed, maintained, and hopefully in future will grow into substantial projects themselves. So I wanna finish up with that simply saying, this kind of projects, project uh, delivers as a project on the idea of a museum without walls. It breaks down boundaries of who can participate in a museum, what kind of art can we call art and belongs in a museum. Um, it takes the museum uh, artwork out of the museum and it puts them in the platteland into the felt it puts them in other environments and in the end it's this kind of project also starts to shape what the actual building can do and can accommodate and over time these these kind of projects will flow into each other so i think that's my part of the presentation i'd like to hand over to a robin uh, at the, uh, right now who is the director of the museum um, thank you Thank you very much, Rudolf. That's, that was such a lovely way of, of going down memory lane for me over these past, uh, what is it, year and a half now of, of re-envisioning the museum. And also just, it's so emotive because it's exactly what, what we were trying to create, is that it's, it's the building and it's, it's the collection at the heart of it, but it can have so much more reach with a bit of imagination and with a bit of collaboration, which I think is, is the very big part of what I've learned certainly through, through this experience is that um, one little person or one little group of people can't 
in any way manage these kinds of things without that collaborative spirit. So thank you very much for very succinctly taking us through that, I think. Um, and then I'm just going to talk now about on the history of the collections, if we can have the, the slide of the building there. Thank you. So there you go. That's what it looked like before all those, those beautiful shots that we just saw from Rilof. Um, the building itself, uh, the idea of, of building it was actioned after a fire broke out in the family home in Stellenbosch. And it had been brewing for a while, but uh, Mrs. Rupert, Mrs. Um, Uberta Rupert was the one who said, now it's time, we've got to build this space. And she came together with Hannes Mehring, a local architect, to, to think up a kind of space that would settle into the, the vernacular of, of Stellenbosch architecture. They didn't want an ostentatious space. They didn't want uh, anything elaborate. In fact, Mrs. Rupert wanted a, a smaller building and she wanted it quite modest. She wanted it um, hung salon style so that anybody could come in there and see almost every piece available in the collection that's not on show elsewhere. Um, so she really wanted people to be able to immerse themselves in, in what they had managed to acquire over the years since the 1940s when they started collecting. And of course, the space which opened in 2005 is well known for showing 20th century South African paintings and sculpture. And these works like the Stearns and, and Jean Belts and Maggie Loebsch's and so on form part of, and you can go to the, the next slide, form part of the Rupert Art Foundation, which was really what came from, from their home. But more, more than just that, they also wanted to share um, the projects and the endeavors and, and, and all the other things that were involved in, which was, which was very broad, which was very international. Um, and the scope of which was, um, yeah, there you'll see some of the old pictures again of the inside of the museum. Uh, one thing that I'd like to point out here is the, the little round windows gave us quite a bit of difficulty when we were hanging exhibitions. And so we're really happy now to have a solid, um, you know, we've, we've put the drywalling inside. So from the outside, you still have the beautiful um, detail, but from the inside, we can go to town and really hang from the biggest works to, to all the works um, on our new hanging system, which doesn't make marks and go, go into the walls. So I'm, I'm very excited about that, just on a, a curatorial side. But to pick up where I left off, um, also, the museum was known for featuring certain of the international artists' work. And this forms part of another foundation called the Uberta Hoerte Foundation, after Uberta's maiden surname. And here you'll see we've got Auguste Rodin, we've got Emile Antoine Baudel, um, Aristide Mayol, and many, many other um, French and Italian sculptors' work uh, through that period which is a wonderful, a wonderful inclusion in, in our daily work as Eliz and I have to manage um, this collection as well and its movement, which is mainly outside of South Africa. But you can go to the next slide. It also includes, there you go, um, our French modern tapestries. On the right, you see one by Robert Wojensky, but we've got quite a large collection of tapestries by Jean Belts uh, and several of his other contemporaries. I'm not talking too long on this now because Amanda will pick up on it as well a bit later. And then we've got on your left there, you've got Giacomo Bala, the Fist of Boccioni, a very dynamic piece, a very special piece. And we've got several other Bala artworks in the collection. So, so that's also a wonderful inclusion in terms of the scope of, of the collection. I can go to the next one where you'll see some of our art that features the kind of optical illusion. Sorry, Robin. This is Sorry, Robin, please can you unmute yourself? Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was <laughs> muted there for a moment. My so in front, of you, in front of you, you've got some of Yaakov Agam's work. Uh, we've got quite a few works in, in this particular style where it looks at, at optical art. Um, an incredible collection as well that uh, we can at some point bring to the museum and, and show in, in a new way, which, which I'm excited about for the future. Um, Elise, you can go to the next. 
Right. And so here we see the, in fact, sorry, just go back one more. Not to talk only to the op art, but before we jump into the new space, we also have parts of the collection that I'm looking forward to including in future exhibitions that are key in terms of international art. Sorry, there's some disturbance on the line. Mute yourselves, please. And these pieces are fabulous works like Henry Moore's, um, we've got Barbara Hepworth, we've got uh, uh, Alexander Calder Mobile. Um, I didn't include a lot of images here for, for these works, but there are some really spectacular, spectacular pieces that um, I really am excited about for the future. So sorry, I just wanted to mention that before we jump into the next. Thanks, Elis. Here we see Willy Bester in front, uh, one of his newer works, and at the back you can see our piece, Crossroads um, from 1991, and Keith Dietrich on the right there. And to give you a bit of context here, we decided that um, because the one of the foundations I hadn't mentioned earlier, which we, we manage is the Rembrandt van Rijn Foundation, that we will take a look at that particular foundations collection, as it features a lot of South African art, including some of the more contemporary pieces. And this was also a more corporate collection. But the wonderful thing about the Rembrandt van Rijn Foundation is also that it's, it sponsored a competition for young artists during the 80s and the 90s called the Cape Town Triennials. It started in 1982, the first one, the last one was in, in 91. And it was at an incredibly port, important time in development, I think, of, of South African artists who were struggling with um, incredible social ills at the time. Apartheid was, was in its throes as well, in its death throes, I'd say. And it was a time of a lot of fear coming out of censorship. So it was a very, very, very difficult time for artists to create and then to be bold and creative. And then also just at, it, at its edges, I feel it was bristling with, with a feeling of, of energy and, and, and looking to, to change, which we experienced in the early 90s. And what we were so surprised about um, when we put these, these artists to work together is that you could see that they, their formative years, that they shared this experience, this uncritical and, and sorry, not uncritical, this unabashed and extremely critical kind of look at what, what is happening in the world around them. They took this from their, their very earlier works through to the production today. And I feel that the moment of the, the Cape Town Triennials, which for the artists of the time gave them a platform to stand on, to have their works shown in, in galleries around the country. Um, it gave them that kind of voice that stuck with the development of, of contemporary South African art to the point that today I feel that uh, emerging contemporary artists stand on the shoulders of some of the production that, that was done at that time. There you've got um, a video of Kentridge's in the background, and you can just see the kind of energy that's happening between these pieces. We decided to put very few pieces in the exhibition at any one time, and rather rotate them over three month periods. So there you've got Penny Siopus, new and, and old on, on the right, and um, you've got Willy Bester and Keith Dietrich, you can't really see into the shoots at the back. But um, this gives you an idea of how much the scale, this is a very big room, and how much space each work needed. And yet, although in the mediums, they were shouting, you know, they were very experimental at that time as well, in terms of Penny's cake paintings and the development, if you look at uh, Willy Bester's work as well, to just find new ways out of almost creating um, creating hope and energy out of the discarded. And if you can continue, Ellis, and there you see a Diane Victor, another artist born of that period whose artworks is incredibly, it's just critical on social ills, it's critical, it was then and is now and continues into the future to, to take apart not only who we are as South Africans, herself as a woman and as an, as an individual, but also 
the, the larger driving forces that, that govern us, whoever they may be. She is, is unflinching in her approach. You've got Steve, uh, Stephen Cohen's work as well. The, on the floor piece is an installation, um, which includes, you can't see it very well, but includes a lot of found objects that he's manipulated, all ballet shoes, which is an ode to his, his partner who had passed away, who was a, a ballet dancer as well. And the two of them worked together on choreography and all sorts of projects. And so he took this moment to really celebrate this, this person, but at the same time to show the kind of difficulties that LGBTQ people deal with in, in their everyday life, in their growing up and, and in South Africa today. And so I thought that was a great piece, including the, the installation on the floor and then one of his earlier pieces there, the chair that you see in the background. And of course, on the left, you can see one of um, Diane Victor's monumental pieces there, the smoke portraits, which in its very sensitiveness and its very ephemeral kind of um, approach, it's, it's a, a technique that with, made with the flame of a candle could easily be disturbed by, by touch. You could smudge that work and, and you could destroy it. But at the same time, it is just so incredibly powerful. Some of our visitors say when they see that piece, it, it feels like they, they're not looking at the faces of the people, but they're looking at kind of their, their souls that are escaping them. So it's, it's a very, it was, it was a wonderful piece to include in this particular show. You can give us the next slide there, Liz. Right, that's, that's a newer Penisiopus where you'll see she used her um, pigments and the, the glue solution, which she applies directly on a flat canvas and then moves around, which is, which is it's just such an incredible medium because on one hand, you've got almost no control what happens with that pigment as it, as it flows and bleeds. And on the other hand, it's, um, it can take quite a bit of her incredible technique to find those, those ways to manipulate it. And I think she's just done a fantab uh, fantabulous, I'm making up words here, um, a fantabulous uh, 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 painting through these smaller paintings and then also including the little figures, which you can't see too well there, but um, it's, a, it's an incredible piece. I think the next one we've got, Liz, is of, oh no, we don't have that one. We don't have the, the cake one. In any case, you saw it from, from a distance in the installation. This particular picture you see here is from the exhibition we called Faces and Figures. Now Faces and Figures is of 20th century art featuring seven different artists, these being Irma Stern, Maggie Loebscher, uh, Gerard Bengu, um, Gerard Sokoto, George Pemba, and then sculptures by Anton van Bo and Moses Kotler. And the challenge here was that we wanted to show what we're so well known for, which is that um, 20th century South African art, mm -hmm. and I call it the nougaty heart of, of our collection. And we wanted to show that in all its richness. And we wanted to show it in perspective with other artists that were producing at the time, like Gerard uh, Bengu that you see on the left there, whose work is not in our collection, but it certainly is you know, incredible to see them all together with the, the stern, you've got Pemba on, on the other side. And what happened is Eliz and I, we spent a lot of time just going through uh, external parties collections, visiting them, um, eventually sitting with so many little thumbnails, trying to figure out you know, what will work beautifully together. But on the day that we, we were in the museum and we opened those crates, it seemed that the artworks were having conversations. Um, beyond what what we had planned. And so we carefully grouped them together and and um, moved them around so that we could see where the conversation sparked mostly. And we found that there was so much between this, you see here is um, Jared Bengu's uh, watercolors of the, the little children and on the other side, you've got Moses Kotler but also that uh, Bengu's work spoke so beautifully with the very detailed sculptures of Anton van Vaux. Now Bengu, and if you look at these child, sorry, you can go back, I'll continue to talk about the children a little bit. Um, he is sometimes berated for um, painting the little children and often repeating 
the, the, the same sitter's painting over and over again. But what we must realize is that artists like Bengu had to continue to produce work to put food on the table, basically. And you see that down to the scale of, of his work as well. He often worked a lot smaller, which just has a practical Im implication in that he had to, by foot, take his works through and, and sell it to people. And he knew that they loved the portraits of the children. So he produced many of the portraits of the children. But you'll find that in all the incredible detail of the watercolors that he certainly didn't sort of churn them out. They, they were very beautifully and, and attentively done. You can go to the next slide, thank you. In the background there, you see a lovely uh, trio in conversation with two pembers on either side. The one, quite a, a tragic scene of um, a family having to move. And of course, they just carrying their furniture and their bags and, and physically having to, to move that way without assistance of a vehicle. On the other side, you also see a pember that's at the clinic um, where there's a nurse, it's quite a famous um, painting. And in the middle, a Maggie Lopesha. And what was lovely about this little conversation is, I'm sorry, I'm going over to time here, but is that um, the palettes, the mood, the sensitivity, even the technique speaks to each other so well. And you've got these three paintings are made by two artists who didn't share the same kind of um, educational experience in terms of their, their developing their career in art. They, they didn't necessarily share the, the same experience in South Africa. So it's wonderful to see that there's still such a common thread in, in how they approach work, which makes you understand that um, there's a lot to be said for the 20th century artists and the particular mood and, and energy of the time. So that little conversation is, is one of my favorites. In front there, you see um, the, the Fortrecker lady with the two children from Van Vo. And then in the background, there's the um, two uh, Harlots of Madeira by Irma Stern. So they, they're just a lovely group together as well. Thank you, Liz. I think that's the last of my slides. So then from this point, I'm going to hand over to Liz. And I just want to say, reiterate again, that um, one of the most important things that, that we learned out of this whole experience is that the two of us being the curators, um, it's, it's just too big a project to handle entirely on our own without the support of uh, persons like Rolof van Weyck, and closely collaborating with um, young Miss Hannelie Rupert. And of course, we have the soundboard of the, the trustees as well. So we used all of these resources and then furthered that as well with, with other galleries, museums in Stellenbosch and as well over, over South Africa. So it's, it's been a wonderful experience. And if, um, Elise, if you can take us through some of those projects, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Robin. So from my, my side, the Elizabeth Mary Scumby, curator of the museum, I'm gonna talk a little bit on the collaborations. Um, Robin and Rulof has touched upon these, but just to show you some highlights. Now the presentation is stuck. Right, so one of the projects, um, or the gallery spaces that you saw is big gallery spaces but we have this beautiful little section that's between the library and the cafe so if you look down and in, into this view you see gallery three which is about i would say a 50 square meter space and um, it gives a great opportunity to collaborate with smaller projects even artists that um, approach us to put up exhibition, exhibitions. And one of these are the book as art object. And that was the book works of Keith Dietrich and Eliane van Aswegen. Now, what was so amazing about this exhibition and collaboration is that we looked at the art medium that is not always seen as the high art or considered as fine art. And it also made us very nervous because the artist wanted the viewer to experience the work. Now I have a lovely 
to experience, I mean to touch. Now, when touching is allowed, my heart stops. And <laughs> it's definitely something that we're trying to engage. Rulo mentioned it earlier, touching sculptures. And it's really amazing to see how a viewer's perspective, feelings change once you experience those works. I mean, for myself and Robin, we've been touching artworks for years, but there is an excitement that it builds. And it's definitely something that we'll be pushing with a lot of eyes on our visitors, but we will be doing it. So that was just a little video that Keith um, Dietrich provided us to show you that in this exhibition, you actually could have touched. With this gallery three, that's being a smaller space, we can incorporate the Maker Studio. Maker Studio giving the opportunity to have a workspace that artists can present workshops. So bookbinder and book specialist, Eliane van Asvegen, did a series of bookbinding workshops. What is great from our side is we do offer these free of charge to the public. If it's part of our public programming, the um, attendance is free, limited um, seats available because our space is quite small, but it's an opportunity we're giving across the board for everybody to join. Another uh, exhibition for Gallery 3 was um, Toyota ESV, e, um, US Wordfears, and we collaborated with the Schrijversfears, specifically bringing to the foreground the book by author Ina Janssen called Swiss Family, Like Family. And this book really focuses on, focus on domestic workers in South Africa and the trouble uh, dialogues and conversations around that. And basically what we did is we sourced through the book the visual representations Iana chose or curated to bring a visual forefront to the subject. And once again, putting in this space leading into the next and it was lovely to collaborate this year with um, Wordfears. It's the biggest festival in Stellenbosch. Last year, unfortunately, our doors were still closed uh, due to our renovations. But this year, we completely collaborated. Um, once again, you're seeing the gallery or the cafe's doors to the left and to the right, the library. And we even collaborated with Strauss and Company. They did valuation days from our library during Wordfear. So that was a lovely energy that was brought to the space as well. Rulof, oh, there is um, just more shots on Swiss Family. The cookie Anamavata to your right is the cover page of all Jena Janssen's books on this specific subject. And we were very fortunate that Javit have her on loan currently, but we flew her in on a British Airways seat and she was present for um, the Wordfears period. Of course, Wordfears was just before um, COVID hit us. So we were very fortunate that at least this was shown. Then activating the garden space. Rulof talked about it. Um, making the space more inclusive and with Wordfears, it was really the first opportunity and collaborative project that the museum grounds outside of the walls were engaged and uh, optimized. So you're looking at a shot from Aubrey de Swart's um, Words Beneath Bridges. Mm -hmm. And basically it was a performance piece that he used the museum grounds and he ended off walking through the vineyards that's next to the museum, going to the graffiti that you see on the Eerste Graffiti Bridge. So for a week and a half, the museum was lit in red. This is the Neil Leroux, also part of this group exhibition, Grenze Sonner Mensa. In the background, you would see the blue villa that we already referenced. So once again, using the museum's garden as spaces for change and engagement. Then uh, lovely workshops that we did from the Maker Studio was with Zion Khan, um, Reclaiming the Pantry. And she really looked at fermentation. So there was a lot of um, workshops that they presented. I think it was three in total that participants could actually ferment their own either salt or sweet. And I was part of that. My vegetables didn't turn out so well and my soda <laughs> went off, but I'll try again. But this is definitely this type of um, workshops opportunities we want to present the public to get their hands dirty, not just with art, but elaborate with different mediums, sciences, disciplines, that we can go across the boundaries. Then talking a little bit on our social media and website, 
pre to renovations. This was an area that was a little bit static and we are really excited to bring life to it and have a social media presence. Social media presence at the moment, I mean, we are Zooming. So it's very, very important now in this COVID stage and going forward that the museum has a presence offline, a museum without walls. So we're jumping back to that theme. So if you're not following us yet on Instagram, please go have a look at Rupert Museum at Rupert Museum on Instagram or um, tag on Facebook is the same. The whole, since lockdown, what we try to do is take you through the viewer or the follower through a journey of highlights through the year since our renovations. So specifically looking at exhibitions, our collection, we've done now all the exhibitions and the South African collections. So from this week, we started focusing on the international artists. I think you will see some Lusa tapestries <laughs> coming up this week, followed by Bordal and Rudal. So please have a look there. And the whole main thing for us is to engage. Now talking about engage, the Getty Museum launched this beautiful project that you can recreate artwork using household objects or anything you can found, find around you to recreate. So the Rupert Museum jumped on board with that and we launched the Recreate Museum Challenge, Rupert Museum Challenge. The idea was to focus on our top eaters like Irma Stern, Maggie Lopesha, Anton van Bo. Weekly, we would put out a work and have the public react it. So there you can see Irma Stern, pomegranate with a beautiful recreation. So the recreate part, firstly, we thought it's actually yourself <laughs> embodying the work, but then in the end, it resulted in artists copying or reinterpreting the work, as you can see here. So that is a beautiful upscaled of one of the pomegranates. Looking at Keith Dietrich's Ilet Malakutu. So jumping between our modern artists and the contemporary ones. This is one of my favorites, I must say. So getting the youngsters involved. And the backstory to this, this little gentleman actually used this as one of his school projects. So he presented it as a school project and I, I'm sure he got full marks for that. So Peter shoots, I mean, even involving the doggies. So then jumping to the website, I know Mia mentioned earlier that you can look at our website. We are currently renov or relaunching this, the website to include some special features. Now the special features will include highlighting our venues that is available for venue hire, booking system, et cetera. Um, and the main thing is moving our collection online. So digitizing. Now you've seen a little bit on our collections. There's basically almost 3000 works that we need to digitize. And we are hopeful that at the end of August, at least we'll have an index of all these works, not to say all the images, but the idea is that this can become an online platform for scholars, researchers, even the general public to see the beautiful treasures that the collection holds. We also have an archive of Richard Townley Johnson, which is 1,630 pieces of copies of Sun Rock Art. I mean, that really fills a gap with the treasure of the, um, the cultural treasure that the country ho um, holds as well. So you can now see we're still closed and we'll definitely keep everybody updated once we reopen. But we are available for any queries. And I think I'm going to hand over to Amanda Boerta now to take us to where everything started, with whom it started, Dr. and Mrs. Hubert Rupert. So Amanda, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very glad that you've had an opportunity to see what came of work that started around about 1940. Uh, Dr. and Mrs. Rupert's interest in art dates back to the, 40, to the 30s when they were students at Pretoria University. Amongst their friends uh, were a number of artists such as Henk Beardnev and Anton van Bouw. They bought their first painting in 1940 and their last painting in 2005, a few months before they both died. The first was the Irma Stern, which is the Max Still Life with Magnolias, 1936. And the last one was Enoch Mashoba, which they expressed interest in, and the purchasing was finally realized after their passing. 
When they moved to Stellenbosch uh, uh, in the 40s, they befriended Irma Stern and Maggie Loebscher and their exhibition uh, supported their, and their exhibition where they supported their exhibition, especially in that time when there was little interest uh, in the works of the expressionists. Later, John Ralph and Cecil Hicks became part of the circle of close friends. Um, they bought directly, the Rupert's bought directly from the studio of these artists and had the first choice of work before their exhibitions. Mrs. Rupert had a very good eye uh, for art and she expressed, uh, Ms., uh, please just show the, Mrs. Rupert had a very good eye for art and would go to an opening of, of an exhibition and immediately select the works that was of interest to her. Many a times artists afterwards commented that she acquired the best works. Mrs. Rupert also paid regular visits to the studios uh, and also was interested to get to know these artists personally. Could you go to the next slide, please? Their aim was uh, to collect, the aim was uh, the, in the South African collection was to acquire a represented collection of the best work available uh, which will represent the period in which they were collected. The ethos of the Rupert family at the time was to share their art with South African public and also to make available, to make the work available to education. I'm glad to say that that is the ethos that the, that the family still uphold these principles today. Please go over to the Zanzibar woman. Uh, these are some of the works that she required. And then the next one, the slide. The next one, please. Uh, this is a slide, this is a self, uh, this is a portrait of the young Mrs. Rupert done in the 40s by Peter Lamb. And this was also part of the family uh, uh, collection and is now still within the family. I can say that sometimes <laughs> these work also rotate and is seen at the Lamotte Gallery which belongs to Hanneli Rupert of Kuchlenberg. The Ruperts had a very special uh, relationship with Irma Stern, if you could just go to that again. And the aim was, as I said previously, to collect as much as uh, the work of Stern, as complete as possible, representing the works from the various periods. This particular, this particular painting of the Zanzibar woman of 39 was acquired, uh, acquired by the Rupert's in the early 40s, bought directly from Irma Stern's studio. Uh, there was, between the Stern, Irma Stern and uh, the Rupert's, there was a mutual trust and respect and a friendship over many, many years. Today, the Stern collection comprises of a work, the, today the Stern collection in the Rupert comprises of a work from 1916, which is the Eternal Child, if you would just show that. And the last turn was bought in 1966, just before the artist died. About the Eternal Child, this, this painting was part of Stern's own collection. And when Dr. Rupert showed interest in the work, it was agreed that if the painting was for sale, they would be the first buyers. This arrangement was honored 25 years later. The Eternal Child was for many years on permanent loan in the South African National Gallery. The, word, the story that I heard at the time was that Stern was rather keen that this work should remain and be bought by the gallery, but no such offer came. In 65, Stern informed the Ruperts that they can purchase the painting. It was collected the very next day and hanged in Dr. Rupert's uh, Stellenbosch office until he retired and then it became part of their home collection. I must mention that the Ruperts bought art from auctions, private collectors, and mostly and regularly from artists themselves. Would you go over to the next sculptures? Uh, they also possess a superb sculpture collection, which includes an extensive collection of Van Gogh works, as well as fine examples of Citoli, uh, and many others. The Rupert collection also includes an extensive international collection of dance sculptures, as been mentioned previously, 
Italian contemporary art sculptor Katie Colwich, uh, a French tap tapestry, just to mention a few. Will you please show the uh, Katie Colwich? The Katie Colwich, this mother and twins, was a particular favorite piece of Mrs. Rupert. She was uh, she was very keen to slowly collect the, in, as many of the works available uh, of Colwich which in the end was, I think, 26 pieces. The international works were often shown in South Africa at major public galleries, as well as at the Rand Easter show. They were always generous and keen to share their collection with the public at large. Books, books. Uh, they commissioned two books, Irma Stern and John Welts, uh, which is available in both Afrikaans and English. And also, we also touched earlier on the importance of their contribution towards the Cape Town Triennial, and that which they sponsored, and also uh, they sponsored this for all the many years, and they also bought the prize, the, the first the first three prizes, that was part of the deal. Uh, in this way, they collected the works of Kentridge, Siopas, Carl Nell, Billy Bester, and many others. The very last time that Dr. and Mrs. Rupert, this is the work from Kentridge, and then uh, the very last time that Dr. and Mrs. Rupert visited the museum was in the beginning of October uh, 2005. Mrs. Rupert died that month and Dr. Rupert three months later in 2006. I would just like to mention that when they opened the exhibition, when they opened their gallery uh, at the museum in, in 2005, it was one of the most exclusive gallery openings, I think, that you could imagine. There were only eight people present for this evening. It was not an ostentious affair, it was just for the family. And it was a celebration of finally a dream come true for Mrs. Rupert. Thank you so much. <laughs>